The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, hello everyone. My name is Erin Page and I'm the Senior Law Librarian on staff with Fast Case Legal Research. Uh, before we get started, we just have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, the first announcement uh, is that you are currently in listen-only mode. Uh, this means that there's less background noise, but uh, you'll be able to hear the presentation better. However, you can still ask questions during today's presentation. We welcome all questions. To ask questions during the presentation on your GoToWebinar pop-up, you will have access to a questions button. When you click on that button, it submits questions that we can view during the presentation. And we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Also, uh, we, today's session is not available for CLE credit. Now, today's session is not CLE accredited. Uh, FastCase does offer CLE accredited webinars that are available. Um, you can see a full list of those webinars on our support page, fastcase.com forward slash support. Um, but we do uh, welcome your participation and enjoyment of today's session. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today's uh, session. Uh, presenting for today will be Michael Sanders. He is the founder of Docket Alarm and a wonderful person to speak to on the issue of current litigation and current issues in legal uh, tech. So Michael, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Hi, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background and then we're going to launch right into it. Uh, so for those who are um, not familiar with Docket Alarm um, or, or who I am, uh, my name is Michael Sander. I'm the founder and managing director of Docket Alarm. Before, uh, before founding Docket Alarm, I was a litigation associate um, at an intellectual property law firm. Um, and before that, I was a So uh, Docket Alarm kind of came out of my experience um, uh, as a litigator. And uh, I kind of had the technical chops to, to put it together um, with my prior experience as a, as a developer. Uh, in 2018, Docket Alarm was acquired by Fastcase, um, which many of you may know uh, has hundreds of thousands of attorneys nationwide that use the service, um, largely through the State Bar Association or through law firm subscriptions. Um, and Docket Alarm is the docket component uh, of, the fa of Fastcase in many ways. Um, so I'm going to just talk about quickly about what Docket Alarm really does, and then we're going to really just go right into the COVID litigation. Um, there, there's four main functions that Docket Alarm does. Uh, one is we can track cases and uh, track issues and track a variety of different, um, of different litigation events that are coming up in the court. Uh, we can search for them. We can kind of find that needle in the haystack. Uh, and we can also provide analytics um, and uh, kind of see, see a picture from, from see the forest for the trees um, using our litigation analytics tool. We also have an API um, that will, uh, that's really useful for downloading, you know, large amounts of information. Um, but the reason I'm kind of focusing on this is, is this is really what this, this presentation is today. Uh, is not, it's not going to be um, a 50 state survey of every single litigation issue that's coming up across the country. Um, you know, COVID right now is, taking over every sector of their economy uh, and to talk about every single issue that can possibly come up is just not going to happen. Um, it's also not going to be practice area focused. Uh, if you're a patent litigator or an employment litigator, uh, litigator, um, there's stuff that will be relevant to you in here, uh, but it's not, it's, it's not catered to any one particular practice area. This is really just catered to litigators at large. Um, what we're going to be trying to show you is how to keep up to date with all these changes that are coming on, uh, that are going through the litigate, legal system today. Um, and examples and strategies of that. Uh, and, you know, along the way, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll find some amusing examples um, and also some useful examples that you can actually apply to your day-to-day uh, -day litigation practice. But the truth is, really what we're trying to show you here is how to find this information. 
Um, so let's just talk about really what it is that we are going to be talking about today. Um, one, we're going to be talking about existing cases and how, uh, how COVID-19 is really affecting existing cases across the country. Um, and then how to find out information of whether your cases are going to, how they are going to be affected. Uh, then we're gonna be talking about new cases. Obviously, with a disaster at this scale, a crisis at this scale, there's going to be a significant amount of litigation fallout. Um, last week, I gave a webinar kind of, and we went over maybe one or two cases um, that were already filed. Now there's many, many more, uh, more cases than I can talk about in a one hour webinar. Um, but I picked out a few of them uh, just a kind of across the board smattering of cases um, that we can kind of see some of the legal issues that are coming up. And it's also primarily showing you how to find these types of cases. Um, and then finally, I'm going to bump, jump right into analytics. Um, Dr. Alarm has the ability of creating custom analytics uh, that are catered to any particular, um, you know, practice area or legal issue. Uh, and we actually created um, yesterday, in about 20 minutes, I created a, uh, litigation analytics on the COVID-19 crisis. Um, these, these are very superficial analytics. Uh, not don't want to get your hopes up, but it's um, it's pretty interesting to see data that we're already pulling out. Uh, you know, just a few a few days or a few weeks into the crisis here, um, at least as far as the United States is concerned. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. Um, these are going to be the three orders for existing cases. Uh, there are some substantive issues that are occurring um, as a result of COVID-19, but really that there's quite a bit of procedural uh, changes that are going on, uh, namely standing orders uh, and continuances, right? There's every single court issuing a number of standing orders. So let me just jump into um, how you can find this information for your particular cases. All right, so standing orders, it's very simple. You just, if you go onto Doc Alarm, you search COVID-19 standing order, uh, you'll find it. And I have a link right here that will do that for me. Let's close up. All right, so we're going to do it manually. Um, let's just, so, oh, I already had it open here. Uh, so if you just type in COVID-19 um, and then space and then a standing order, uh, you'll find quite a bit of information here. Let me make this slightly bigger. Um, there's standing orders uh, across the country from a variety of courts. And you may be wondering, why is it that Docket Alarm, uh, a docket service provider, has standing orders that kind of are supposed to apply to an entire court? Um, and the reason is many court systems actually uh, fashion their standing orders as dockets. Um, so they actually add a new docket. A docket's normally used for a lawsuit, uh, but many courts, New York Southern District Court, for, um, for example, fashions their standing orders as cases. Uh, so if, if you don't, aren't, don't have access to dockets, it might be difficult to find these standing orders. They usually also have them on their website. Uh, they can be buried. You have to should check out the website as well. Um, but one of the beauties of docket alarms, when they are fashioned as dockets, which is often the case, uh, you know, you can just do a simple search like this and um, get these results. Uh, you can also track the search so that you can be notified of all of the new standing orders that come up. Um, and it's, it's a very nice tool to be able to stay on top of things. Uh, you can see some of the courts that we have, look, 129 from West Virginia, um, Illinois. Uh, there's also state courts in here. Um, what I just did over there is on the left-hand side, I, I expanded the court filter. Uh, so you can you can really find um, just just the standing orders related to those. Uh, so I'm in New York, so you know I'm just going to put in a filter uh, court New York just to search for the standing orders there. Um, you know there's 46 just for New York, uh, quite a bit. Um, what I've done is I basically I went through these before this call and kind of made a quick timeline of what is actually going on in New York Southern District Service, uh, New York Southern District Court. Um, I haven't even checked it this morning. It's very possible that something new came out. Um, but, you know, it's, this is a kind of a quick timeline showing you all of the different changes that are happening um, in New York Southern District Court. Uh, you know, as far back as March 13th, they had uh, waivers for certain types of personal service. Um, the courthouse pretty much went in lockdown on March 16th, um, mostly for civil cases. Uh, criminal cases had, were a little, little bit more lenient. And, and you'll see this. There's kind of uh, criminal cases, obviously, due to, for due process reasons. Um, the restrictions are, are quite different. Um, so, you know, there's, they have body temperature scans for certain uh, people entering the building. Um, and uh, non-essential workers went on leave, um, uh, I guess that was last week. Um, and now, somewhat re exactly one week ago, uh, they started doing grand juries by teleconference. 
Um, so this is a pretty, pretty um, interesting recent development um, that are happening in Southern District of New York. And, and you know, if you go through, uh, if you, you know, just type in any state that you want or select it from the drop-down menu, uh, you can find similar orders in Docket Alarm um, for whatever state or jurisdiction that you're, that you're really interested in. I notice here there's actually one uh, for New York Southern Bankruptcy Court as well. Um, so they have their own standing order. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, here, here's my next slide. It's really going over um, how to find these in other jurisdictions. Uh, here are kind of a number of standing orders that I found across the different jurisdictions. Um, I kind of rank them from uh, most stringent to least stringent. Uh, Illinois Circuit Court uh, basically just continued every single hearing. Uh, they just, everything was delayed. Um, some other ones, they rescheduled, they, they continued them, but they rescheduled them. Um, some of them are doing telephonic hearings. Uh, and kind of my favorite, Eastern District of Texas, a somewhat infamous jurisdiction, um, they've really, it's, it's the most lenient in many ways. Uh, really, if there's any issue, you just have to take it up with the court. I think within 14 days, um, we can take a look at that order uh, just by clicking on the link here. Um, here's their standing order. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have to go into the details, but generally, um, Oh yeah, within three days of any hearing, they more or less have to uh, uh, um, uh, schedule a meeting with the court to discuss how you're gonna deal with COVID-19. Um, so this really just shows you the range of procedures that are going on across jurisdictions in the country. There's no one size fits all here at all. Uh, you really have to be up to date on what's going on for your particular jurisdiction, your case. Um, and then there's also uh, these quasi procedural um, uh, changes that are going on, like District of New Jersey modified their speedy trial rules um, and uh, as a result, that, that's, I think that, I believe, I haven't read the order in full, but I believe it's mostly uh, relevant to uh, criminal defendants. Um, that said, you know, some of these, uh, it's, it's a more substantive type, it's a procedural issue, but it, in many ways it's had some substantive effects as well. Um, so staying on top of all, all these standing orders is, is, is really important. Um, in addition to standing orders, you know, pretty much every single litigator in the country uh, who has had a trial or has a trial or a hearing coming up probably asked for a delay. I mean, we've seen thousands of them. Um, so we can actually search for these as well. Uh, what I've done here is I've crafted a search. Uh, what we're going to do is look for COVID-19 or coronavirus within 20 words of continuance or delay. And let me just click on that. Hopefully it pops up this time. Nope. I don't know why the searches don't want to come up in PowerPoint, but that's quite all right. We can just do it here. So we're going to do COVID-19, not 18, or continuance, oops, or coronavirus, and 20 of continuance or delay. Um, and what are we actually searching here when we're running this search? Uh, we're actually searching all the docket sheets and underlying documents uh, within cases that have the words COVID-19 or coronavirus within 20 words of the, of the words continuance or delay. Um, and you can see there's 5,200 cases here. Uh, I believe, actually, if you take a look, um, when I took the screenshot, I think this was yesterday, the day before, uh, it was 4,400. So, that, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of new continuance requests are coming in every single day. Um, and staying up to date on this is, 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 is pretty, uh, can be difficult, it, impossible without a tool like Docket Alarm. Um, so, uh, I've gone through a number of these continuances. Um, as you can imagine, the vast majority of continuance requests were all granted. Um, but what I did, I tried to do is I tried to find something a little bit more interesting, uh, given this a webinar, um, and tried to find some continuances uh, that were actually de denied. Um, and so what I did here is I did a search for the word continuance or delay within three words of the word denied. And then I added a, a, date, a date search, um, date limiter, uh, only looking for cases, or sorry, for cases or documents filed um, from March 15th. Uh, so really, we're looking for uh, interesting cases um, where continuances were denied. As a litigator, you know, you might want to know under what circumstances uh, continuance uh, is, will be denied. Um, I found one, uh, one particular case in Connecticut Superior Court, so this is a state court in Connecticut, um, where they basically deny the continuance but without prejudice uh, and basically said they're going to punt it um, until the court, when the court reopens. So this is a quasi-denial. I'm not really sure if it counts. Um, but uh, regardless, this kind of just illustrates how different uh, courts are approaching this problem differently. Um, and knowing what your court is going to be doing is, is pretty key. So being able to, you know, if you have a case, another case, 
pending in front of uh, Connecticut State Superior Court, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is very helpful to know in advance what it is that this court will be doing uh, for your particular case. Uh, I did find one a substantive denial, a real uh, motion for continuance that was denied. Again, this was nowhere else but Eastern District of Texas. Um, this was a case involving Amazon, uh, and the party submitted a motion um, that to, for a continuance. I forget what type of hearing it was that they were actually trying to continue here. Um, but they, they, the parties requested that this uh, court continue all deadlines. Or I guess they tried to continue everything uh, for 30 days due to concerns arising from coronavirus. Um, and they talked about how Amazon uh, has a work from home order so none of their employees can come to the court. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, this is, they had some language here. While the court is sensitive to the party's concerns and the hazards associated with coronavirus, the court's not inclined to implement the delays. The next sentence down here is the court is confident that the attorneys, are, uh, the attorneys from the parties can craft viable solutions um, that allow the case to continue while minimizing the potential health risk. Um, so, you know, striving to balance the decision between the competing parameters of prudence and panic, the court is of the opinion that the motion should and should be in hereby is denied. You know, it's, it's uh, so here is actually a denial of a continuance um, in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, I never thought I'd be doing a webinar on continuances of all things, um, but here we are. Uh, so uh, just a, there is a follow up to this particular case. Notice that this, this particular order was issue, issued on March 12th. Um, which is uh, now uh, two weeks ago. Um, about a one week ago, one or one week later after this order came out, the um, the parties in that case issued a renewed joint motion for a 30-day continuance, uh, and the court actually granted it. So, you know, while things, while courts may differ in their particular approach, they also put, uh, differ based on the facts on the ground. What the court does, does last week, uh, did last week, might not be the case of what they're going to do this week. Um, and so having an up-to-date source of information is actually critical. Like the, the continuances are not going to appear in any, um, you know, any legal news source. This is, uh, these things are so, you know, kind of minute and specific to litigation practice that you really need a docket tool to kind of uncover this information. Um, oh, I want to also point out there are some uh, procedural but some substantive changes that are going on as well. Um, so here I did a search uh, also for discovery motions. Um, and motion practice generally, also looking for COVID-19. Um, and this is a particular case, uh, I can pull up this order. This is actually in the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. So if there's any um, PTAB litigators on the call, this might be relevant for you. Uh, a party tried to get additional discovery and tried to use uh, the COVID-19 crisis um, as kind of a reason for gaining that additional discovery. Uh, and and they, they, they were denied. Um, but it kind of just shows you that uh, folks are, you know, with Dr. Alarm, you're not just searching the orders and the decisions, you're also searching the motions. Um, and we can actually pull that up right here. All right, these don't, doesn't want to work, so let's just type in the docket number. Well, I, I don't want to waste too much time on this. Uh, let me just pull this back up. The, the exact, um, oh, wonderful, uh, the exact um, text of the, of the motion doesn't really matter too much. Um, what matters really is that people are trying to use COVID-19 uh, as, as a tactical strategy in particular cases, um, which I've not found any case where this has been received well by the court, uh, but people are trying nevertheless. Um, oh, this is an also another substantive change. Uh, I'm not sure how many criminal uh, defense attorneys are on the fall or maybe even on, the, on the call, uh, or maybe there even are some uh, prosecutors as well. Um, but docket alarm, you know, uh, sorry, but uh, COVID-19, um, is also having, it is having some real substantive changes, uh, in particular with bail. Um, this is a case I found uh, where an, arg uh, an attorney argued successfully uh, to lower bail amounts because um, uh, they didn't want their client to be put into a prison where, uh, you know, there's a real fear of, of coronavirus running rampant. Um, so, you know, here, this, this is the judge's order. Uh, this, due to the unprecedented and extraordinarily dangerous nature of COVID-19, uh, inmates may be at a heightened risk of contacting COVID-19 should an outbreak uh, develop. Taken together, these changed circumstances necessitate a reconsideration of defendant's bail conditions. Um, so for litigate, for criminal defense attorneys uh, who have clients that might be put into prison, um, you know, these arguments are working. In, at least this is in one particular court, Southern District of New York. Uh, however, um, you know, we can search docket alarm a little bit more to try to find if these conditions have arisen elsewhere. It wouldn't surprise me at all if they have. Um, so these are kind of the overview 
of existing cases. Uh, and I just want to kind of go back and show you just quickly kind of how uh, I was I was doing these uh, uh, these searches. Um, really, kind of the trick is, you know, if, if you're doing searching on Doctat Alarm, what you want to do is you want to find a good keyword search and then also heavily rely on the filters on the left-hand side. Um, as you can see, I, this is a very general search. It's searching nationwide. It's searching uh, all state courts and agency courts. Um, and, you know, it could be a little bit too much. It's depending on uh, it, it's depending on the issue that you're actually looking for. Sometimes you might want to find a particular uh, jurisdiction. Um, sometimes you don't. So you can use these court filters on the side to kind of narrow it down here. We also have a big court filter up here on the top uh, that allows you to filter um, in an organized manner. Whoa, right there. Oh no, my internet went down. You probably cannot see the screen. Give me one second. Let's reconnect. Last thing you want to do in a COVID-19 case is, let me pause, restart. All right. Um, last thing you want is to lose your internet in this, uh, in this case. Uh, so there's this button up here on the top right that kind of guides you through all the courts that we offer. Um, so we have agency courts, uh, lots of courts in the patent uh, IP related. Um, we just literally yesterday released a new court, uh, new agency, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, you know, there's quite a few issues uh, coming up right now over using big technology companies uh, to track the movements of people across the country. Um, that, that those haven't gotten off the ground yet, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but if they do, you better believe there will be some um, SEC-related uh, activity uh, um, with respect to, the, to that type of tracking. Uh, SEC, for those who aren't familiar, um, is really a consumer protection agency and also in recent years has gotten very involved in digital, uh, digital privacy issues. Um, so they have uh, quite a bit, there's quite a bit of, uh, not really case law, but um, agency precedent uh, based on that that's all searchable uh, through Docket Alarm. Um, for the state court litigators, we have a wide variety of different state courts that you might be interested. I'm sure there's many people from California. We have all of the different uh, the metro areas in California. We don't have all of the counties yet. Uh, we're adding them, but every metro area is covered on docket alarm. Um, and then obviously we have all federal uh, litigation as well. So all this is full text searchable uh, and then filterable on the left hand side as well. Um, so let's kind of move on. Uh, new cases. What are the new cases that are going to be filed um, as a result of uh, COVID-19? Um, one, I'm going to go over some, some interesting cases uh, that actually came up, uh, that are actually a direct result of the litigation fallout. Um, but I also want to briefly touch on uh, some procedural issues um, that are coming up as a result of COVID-19. So these are uh, cases that were going to be filed shortly um, and uh, but they, they were going to be filed regardless of COVID-19. But now the attorneys involved in filing these cases have to jump through a number of additional hoops um, because the court is closed. How do you file a case if the court is closed? Uh, or if you cannot reach your co clients because they're at, like, uh, there's a travel ban on where, where they're located or, or you know, you're in a city without practicing social distancing. Um, there's actually a, a how, how do you even get an affirmation from your client um, if to, to attach to a complaint? Uh, so there's quite a bit of, um, procedural issues and filing new cases as well. Uh, let's go to kind of the, the fun stuff, if you will. Uh, here's, um, oh, before I go to the fun stuff, let's actually just jump into how I actually found these cases. Um, let's run the search. So you can find, again, this, the focus here is not to tell you every single lawsuit that's coming up in, uh, in light of COVID-19. It's to really help you find those cases yourself. Um, so what I did here is I just did a search uh, for COVID-19 or coronavirus. I'm just gonna delete that and just run the search again. Um, it comes up, and then over here on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that there's a, a button that actually allows you to filter by pleading. So pleadings are basically, um, they're broadly defined because we have agency courts uh, that don't really have things called a complaint, but a, a, a pleading is basically any complaint, any answer. Uh, if you're an agency, it's a petition. Um, uh, that, that would also count as a pleading. Um, so there's our, our emergency applications are pleading. Uh, so there's there's quite a bit of different stuff that kind of qualifies 
as, as a pleading within docket alarm. And you can find that pretty easily. Uh, then we can also use the date filter over here to find um, you know, something a little bit more recent. Um, you can actually see there's quite a bit of uh, older cases, older cases that mention uh, coronavirus. I actually went through these. I was like, why were people talking about coronavirus in 2009 and two, or 2008? Uh, it turns out um, there's, there's actually, coronavirus is, refers to a wide variety of different uh, diseases. The, the term coronavirus, only COVID-19 refers to the specific uh, genetic sequence that we're dealing with today. Um, and back in 2008, there was actually a number of patent applications uh, that were written for in response to um, uh, patent applications that were um, uh, targeting co uh, coronavirus um, vaccines. And uh, Docalarm actually has all patent applications inside of its um, inside of its database. So when you're searching Docalarm, uh, this is also very helpful for patent litigators. Uh, we can search all of patent prosecution history, so terms like coronavirus come up as well. Um, but here we've done just basically a filter. Uh, now we're just looking at um, uh, new pleadings uh, that mention COVID-19 or coronavirus filed since um, basically this summer. Uh, and you can see there's quite a bit. Um, I've actually gone through most of these, kind of skimming them to see find things that are interesting. Uh, and I pulled, put together a few of them. Um, this is one I found interesting. Uh, for those who have been following the news, you might be aware, familiar with um, uh, the Princess cruise lines. Uh, it was a large ship uh, where there was an outbreak of coronavirus and uh, a number of the passengers on the ship got sick um, and there's already been a lawsuit filed on it. It was filed on March 9th and uh, I pulled this bit of out of the complaint um, and uh, you know what I found kind of interesting here is uh, plaintiff Ronald Reisberger is a resident of Broward County, California, uh, Florida and is currently a passenger on board the Grand Princess. Um, so they sued the boat while they're still on it. You, you think you'd probably wait to get off the boat before trying to sink it, um, but that wasn't the case here. So this case, you know, it's, almost all these cases are continued or delayed for, uh, due to the, to the national emergency, but um, uh, the cases are still on file and, and ready to be litigated when, when that, those, those restrictions are lifted. Um, here's another, another example of a case. Um, obviously, there's going to be numerous broken contracts uh, during uh, this outbreak. Um, here is one uh, example of a case that was uh, filed. This was filed on March 12th, um, involving uh, the band The Killers. So The Killers were supposed to perform um, at an entertainment complex. Uh, the uh, venue owner canceled the entertainment complex. Uh, I'm sorry, canceled the concert. Um, and here, the management company managing um, uh, the, uh, the the concert basically said that the SME, which is the management company, and the killers refuse to cancel or postpone the performance and instead insist on full payment, claiming there is no health risk is sufficient to justify cancellation under the, uh, the agreement. Qualitrix, which is, I think, the, the venue owner, uh, disagrees. Um, so this was filed on March 12th, uh, which obviously, as things change, you know, what might have been a, uh, a non-public health emergency on, um, on, on March 12th has uh, changed considerably. Um, so, you know, we can see how this court, uh, this case shakes out. Let me see if I can actually link to it here. Oh, and here's a complaint um, that comes right up. Uh, and then if you want to actually go and view the docket, if you want to see how this case uh, goes, goes forward. So this is true, not just for this one particular case. The reason I'm bringing this up is this is helpful for tracking in any case. Um, suppose you find a complaint like this. Uh, that's interesting that you think, you know, might be relevant to your case, um, you might, you might want to go back and track this case. And so after looking at this uh, document, uh, you can click over here on the left, say view full docket sheet, and then you have the case right in front of you, um, and we can go and track it. Uh, so uh, you can stay up to stay abreast on what's actually going to be happening in this particular case. Oh, um, I, I failed to mention that this was a declaratory judgment action um, by the venue owner to kind of uh, shut down this lawsuit before it actually got started. Um, so uh, there's th these are if you're, if you're a contract attorney, uh, especially litigating where you're in Utah, um, you might be interested, especially if you have other clients that are venue owners or uh, you're in the entertainment practice at all, uh, um, and you know you have clients whose shows have been canceled. Uh, following cases like this to see how they kind of proceed could be pretty relevant to your own practice. Um, so this is uh, kind of one area as well. Uh, let's go into another one. Um, here we actually have. 
a few cases, uh, this is employment litigation. I, I know actually on the webinar, there were a few people from employment law firm that were popping up. Um, just a quick background here uh, while I load this. Uh, for those who are in the employment litigation space, um, you probably are very closely following uh, what you know, what's going on with gig, gig economy workers and whether they can be classified as independent contractors or employees. Um, companies like Uber and Lyft and DoorDash are all trying to classify their workers as uh, independent contractors um, because if they are classified as employees, they will be uh, liable for, you know, minimum wage laws. Um, and in this particular case that we're looking at here, uh, sick leave. So um, I think this case uh, involves somebody who became sick due to coronavirus and um, is now suing, uh, this, this one they're suing Lyft. I saw there was another case, uh, I, I don't have a link to it right here, but somebody else sued Uber as well. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a uh, case, basically they're trying to get sick leave and they can only get it if they're classified as an employee. As independent contractors don't have, um, generally do not have any rights uh, uh, to, to sick leave. Um, so if you're in the employment litigation space, this is definitely something else to be watching out for. Um, so you want to track this case. Uh, you probably want to do searches related to sick leave um, and coronavirus uh, and see how that affects you as well. Um, uh, and here's the link to the complaint. I, I can send out this deck uh, if anyone wants these specific links at the end of the call. Um, and then there's also uh, political insider trading. Uh, so this one I found, it, it, for those who are familiar with this, um, this case, uh, this is an insider trading case involving a politician who sold all of his stocks. You probably read about this case in the news. Um, Richard Burr is a senator. Uh, I forget which state he's in, um, but we can probably read about it in the complaint. And he's already facing a lawsuit under um, uh, for insider trading uh, because he was privy to quite a bit of information concerning coronavirus back in uh, January and February and uh, had the wherewithal to sell all of his stocks um, directly before you know the pandemic hit uh, and basically the argument is that he's uh he had insider information by by um by uh due to his position as a senator um and he had additional health information that was the public was not privy to um so this is relevant this is a pretty unique case uh, i don't you don't see very often um, politicians being subject to insider trading rules uh, but um, you, we could expect uh, we, there's possible additional ones may may appear. Um, so for any of those who are involved in the securities industry, uh, securities practice, uh, this might be something to follow for uh, as well. Um, just want to point out while we're here, uh, you can also use our advanced search tools up here to kind of guide you through some of these searches. Um, and if you want to filter by securities cases, uh, you can do that. So what we can do is we can, if we want to find a case like this. Um, I, what I did is I just went up to the search bar on the top and I clicked this little gear icon that brings up this advanced search query, query build builder. Um, and what you can just do here is just type in like securities or the case type. And then we're gonna look for all of these words, coronavirus, um, or actually, excuse me, any of these words, coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and then we can do a search. And there's already 66 cases that are going out right now. Uh, so a lot of these um, are probably temporary, uh, are, are continuances and temporary procedures. Um, so, you know, we can uh, modify this uh, search to try to get rid of that, um, to get rid of the continuances. Uh, and how would we do that? Um, I would maybe want to say and not um, continuance, maybe. Might lower down significantly. Um, or what we can do is further to end not continuance or temporary. Uh, you can see here is temporary procedures. Let's get rid of those. So you can see here, if you're not a superstar at using these terms and connectors, uh, we can help you make, uh, we can help make you one. Um, we have a chat down here in the bottom right. Uh, we have Erin and her entire team are ready um, uh, from 8 a.m., I believe, till 8 p.m., uh, Monday to Friday. She can correct me if I'm wrong on the dates there, but uh, people are live and ready to help you find particular cases um, in particular jurisdictions that might be uh, that might be relevant to your practice area. Um, so, you know, you can build up these relatively complex terms and connectors to really find uh, the information that you're looking for. 
Um, and, and again, you know, you might, you can also go to a news source, uh, but, you know, journalists use tools like Docket Alarm to find the news. Uh, so if you want it first and you want it quickly, you really do have to be using a tool like Docket Alarm to find that information. All right, so let's just go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, I got one last slide on new cases. Uh, this one is an actual uh, a legitimate securities case. Um, it's, it's kind of a half contract, half securities case. Uh, basically, someone did a margin call on um, uh, on a company that that that's uh, due to the the, the collapse. And um, this is basically say, uh, a lawsuit uh, to try to prevent that margin call. Um, I suspect we'll be seeing quite a bit of those uh, as well. So um, for the folks who are, are are in the security space or have to work at firms that do a lot of securities litigation. Uh, you can expect quite a bit of fallout just due to the volatility of the market right now. Um, and uh, tracking these cases and seeing how they tend to walk their way through court um, can be extremely helpful to, to, to inform your own litigation strategy and, and particular tactical response. Um, so, uh, oh, right. So now th those are kind of the new cases, um, the new substantive cases that are going on. I want to talk a little bit more about the procedural issues. Um, and I found these cases uh, really using the same technique I did before. Um, I was kind of just scanning for any new case uh, that's filed involving coronavirus uh, or, uh, or um, COVID-19. Um, and uh, going through them, I kind of separated them as procedural versus um, uh, procedural versus substantive. We don't currently have a button that you can press that says, find me only substantive issues versus procedural issues. Um, I wish we could do that, but not, it's not quite available yet. Uh, but there's a few issues. Um, so one is uh, one of the more important things that are going on that's going on right now is a lot of um, a lot of uh, practice areas have pre-filing requirements, um, special kind of forms that have to be filled out or examinations that have to be done before you can actually file uh, a lawsuit. And they're running up against the statute of limitations for these. So um, here is a particular uh, example of that. Um, this is in a New York State su uh, Supreme Court um, filed, it looks like 10 days ago. Um, and here's a complaint where the, the attorney is saying uh, plaintiff has not yet been examined pursuant to Section 50H of the General Municipal Law. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the, what this particular section does, it's more or less uh, for certain types of lawsuits that have to be filed, um, the uh, plaintiff has to kind of undergo a, a kind of a kind of like a deposition um, before they can actually file the case. Uh, so uh, the defendant in the case is kind of entitled to an initial investigation or deposition um, before they can actually bring the case to court. And they more or less have to just forego that altogether uh, and file the case anyway, just because they were going to run up in, against the statute of limitations. Um, and I, this is not the only case I found dozens like this. So there's, as cases run up against the statute of limitations and the courts are closed, you're going to be seeing quite a bit of creative attorney um, uh, attorney work uh, to get these cases on file so they don't miss the statute of limitations. Um, as you know, like judges have wide discretion uh, in changing, you know, the format of the case and how they proceed. Um, but statute of limitations are by statute, and uh, it's much it takes an act of Congress or the state legislator to get around that. So um, they're doing what they can to kind of move these things forward in exigent circumstances. Um, here's another example of one, uh, another pre-filing requirement. It's also New York Superior Court. I'm oh, sorry, Supreme Court. Um, so there's an affirmation requirement. The attorneys, I've seen, again, I've seen this many dozens of times. If you look through those results, uh, attorneys are actually making the affirmation themselves instead of plaintiffs because they can't physically get to their, uh, to their clients. Um, and again, they're going to be running us against the statute of limitations. So they're just doing whatever they can um, uh, to get past them. Um, so that, that kind of brings us to the end of the new cases and the procedural issues. The goal here, again, was really to focus on these searches that you can be doing. Uh, I know there's people from a wide variety of uh, jurisdictions, um, but the focus here is really to be able to use uh, complex searches on docket alarm to find the very specific issues that are relevant to your practice area. Um, and we have the search build, the query builder here that can help you do that. Um, and as well as I just note that we have a full search documentation, um, which kind of lays out in, in very gory detail all of the different searches that you can do. Um, and we have, if there's not a way of kind of narrowing things down to try to find exactly what you want, uh, let us know because um, you know it's, it's probably something that we can easily add. Uh, all right, so going on to the last bit here, which is our analytics. Um, so 
searching is all about finding the needle in the haystack, right? Searching is about finding that one specific case uh, that might be relevant to your practice area. Um, for those who are familiar with litigation analytics, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, litigation analytics are for you know, seeing a broad swath of cases. Uh, you want to see how often a motion is granted or denied in front of a particular judge. Like, you know, the, out of the thousand motions that uh, motions are dismissed, a particular judge has decided how many of those motions of dismissals were granted and how many were denied. Um, it's not about finding one or two, it's finding like thousands and kind of analyzing them easily. Uh, most providers of analytics really focus on a particular practice area. Um, and and DocuArm is not too different in this respect. Uh, we have a few practice area tips. Oh, sorry. I'll come back to this. There's, we have additional search tools um, related to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, I'll come back to that just in two minutes at the end. Um, so we have a practice area specific analytics, but we also have a tool called the Analytics Workbench. And the Analytics Workbench allows you to create analytics on virtually any practice area uh, that you want. Um, so, you know, with this coming up, and you can see here all the workbenches I've created. Uh, I have a gender diversity uh, workbench um, in New York State Supreme Court. I have tort cases. Um, we have some Arkansas State uh, court cases. Um, we really have any jurisdiction that Dr. Lam covers, you can build analytics for it. Um, so uh, you can do build analytics on particular law firms, on particular types of orders, you name it. Um, so of course, what are we going to do? We're going to build uh, analytics on COVID-19. Um, so let's take a look and see what they look like. Uh, so our COVID-19 analytic analysis, the purpose here of these analytics is really to determine how courts are reacting to the COVID-19 crisis and really when they are. Um, and these are very, very new analytics. And at this initial time, they're pretty superficial. Uh, I'm not going to say that this is going to give you any deep insights into um, what's going on in the court. You know, there's uh, about 8,000, 7,200 cases in this analysis. Um, and it's, these, these, these you see, analytics are not really, they're not really, part, the purpose is not really to um, analyze substantive issues. Oops, am I still connected to the internet? Just want to make sure. Just got a message saying we're having this experience of difficulty. Okay, and my internet went out again. Wonderful. I'm sorry, folks. Good thing I'm connected by phone as well. Um, this has been happening regularly now. Uh, the internet just cuts out, but then it comes back in when I reconnect. Apologies for this. Okay, so you should see the screen right now um, that says COVID-19 analysis. Uh, sorry about that. Just had to reconnect. Um, so what we're going to be looking at here is uh, an analytics overview. Uh, you can do analytics on law firms, on companies, you name it. Um, and what I, the, really the goal here was just to try to determine when our case, uh, our court, uh, what, what are they talking about? Um, when, when, what, how, when are courts reacting to the COVID-19 um, uh, um, uh, disaster? What are they doing? And you can see, uh, really, this is kind of what we're trying to show in January. We had 15 cases uh, where people were trying to, uh, you know, modify scheduling orders or do something um, different about uh, COVID-19. Uh, you can see in February that double, uh, almost, you know, didn't double, but there was 21. And then, um, of course, in March, uh, there was 7,000. Um, so this kind of shows you very quickly the, the very fast ramp up of cases uh, that have to do with um, COVID-19 and how they're reacting to them. Um, and, you know, if I rerun these analytics today, I'm sure this number is going to jump up even more. Um, so you, you can actually filter down and, uh, you know, you can see there's actually quite a few divorce cases um, that are, that this is being affected by. There's contract cases. Um, we can click into any of these and uh, really show you um, what, how, how this is affecting these different cases. Uh, this other chart up here, this is kind of a similar chart. It's just showing you the cases um, that were affected, but it's showing you the filing dates of those cases. So, you know, uh, there is 419 cases filed in 2017 that are now being affected by um, COVID-19. And then that number just, you know, dramatically jumps up uh, um, due, to, due, to, uh, due to the coronavirus. Um, and I suspect, you know, as courts react, that these, these numbers are going to increase dramatically as well. Uh, we can also look at parties and see which parties are involved, uh, are being affected the most. Um, but considering that every single party in the country is probably being affected, uh, this doesn't really tell you all that much. So this is why, at this point, these analytics are pretty superficial. Um, 
but uh, you know, as this develops, we will start to try to put together um, uh, analytics on continuances and showing when those uh, come to light, uh, when can, how often continuances are granted or denied, um, and, and that type of information can be uh, interesting as well to look at. Um, so this is a high-level information uh, that you can pull out. Um, again, very very preliminary. Uh, as this as this disaster you know um, progresses, we'll be updating these and adding a little bit more information uh, to them as well. Um, the last bit. Uh, it's supposed to be 45 minutes and leaving five, 10 minutes for questions um, are just some additional resources that we've had, we put right on our front page. Um, so we kind of added a small panel here about COVID-19. Uh, so really, these are specialized links for those who are kind of unfamiliar with our search syntax um, and don't really have the time to just jump in and learn it all. Uh, we have these links right here on the top um, that, that kind of just redirect you to searches that, that we kind of handcrafted. Um, so here's one just looking for COVID-19 or coronavirus within the last 30 days. Um, so these this, these are just kind of links to searches that you can find useful, uh, or you can just type them into the search bar as well. Um, and, and so there's a few different uh, there's a few different um, a few different links here uh, for, for that. Uh, and with that, I think that really the end of this um, presentation. Uh, but just to recap. Um, really, the purpose of Doc Alarm is to track cases, track issues as they arise, stay on top of new information as it's being filed in the court uh, with really fast, um, a fast response time. Uh, these are these are the types of things where you cannot wait for a news article to be written about it. These are the this is the type of tool that the journalists who write the news articles are using. Um, so it's a really helpful tool for tracking issues as as it's coming up. Uh, we also have a search system for finding these particular issues. Um, and our litigation analytics, although a little bit premature, uh, as you know, the issues that are coming up uh, in this crisis are not really um, nailed down just yet, as it's so new. Uh, you can build these custom analytics um, related to COVID-19 and uh, see how they how they're changing um, how they're changing litigation on a macro scale. Um, and that's it. Thank you very very much for joining. Uh, I'm going to push it back to Aaron, if that's all right. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, um, since this is a more general question, we'll start with this. Um, would you go ahead and show, if you don't mind, on Docket Alarm, the link to the search syntax uh, extra information? Right. So how do you, um, I, I kind of breeze through that a little bit quickly. Um, there's a few different options uh, for kind of finding uh, search information. We try to make it as easy as you possibly can. Just when you click up here in the search bar, you'll notice that there's a search engine cheat sheet that just appears. This is a little cheat sheet. This is not our full documentation, but it kind of shows you a little bit of what is um, uh, what you can search for. You know, if you wanted to search for plain English, you can definitely do that. Uh, no need to can't get fancy. Just type what you're looking for. Um, we automatically uh, um, parse out uh, synonyms. So if you search for the word attorney, like we'll find, we'll also search for the word lawyer, that sort of thing. Um, we have also phrases. And if you go towards the bottom down, uh, there's also actually, there's quite a bit of different number of filters. Um, this is actually one of my, more, my favorite ones, actually. We actually have a dollar amount search. Uh, this, I'm not sure it's terribly related to coronavirus, but um, if you want to search for verdicts, uh, you can do that pretty easily on docket alarm. Um, you know, if you want to find a large dollar amount on most other search systems, like uh, if you want to find a verdict for, I don't know, a million dollars, another another search system, you would have to go and like type in, you know, verdict, and then, you know, one zero 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 zero, right? Uh, but what if the amount is one million and one dollars or one million and fifty three thousand um, dollars? With Dr. Lime, you can actually do a, a, a dollar range search. So we can actually, here, if I just click on this link, I'm sorry, I'll actually answer the question, kind of got distracted there. Um, we can actually search for a range of dollar amounts. Uh, so here we're searching for verdict, uh, we're searching for the word verdict and any dollar amount between $100,000 and $5 million. Um, and you can see here, here's like, what is this one? This is $100,442.01, um, some judgment here. Uh, so, uh, these types of searches have become possible with a tool like Docket Alarm. And we actually automatically also find, you know, even if they write out the dollar amount, like $1 million, uh, we'll be able to find that as well. So it's a very helpful tool for finding um, 
these type, this type of dollar amount information uh, that you couldn't find on other services. We, also, some of our other clients are using this to find hourly rates. So if you, you want to find do something like, I don't know, search for hourly rates, um, 200 to $1,200 or something like that, um, you, can, you can do that as well. Uh, so this can be very helpful for finding key information. Um, going back to the original question, apologies for that uh, sidetrack there. Um, so you can kind of go down this cheat sheet, and there's the link right at the bottom. It's full search documentation. You can find it right there. Um, and in addition, we also have, um, this is kind of in, in, in addition to actually learning the search syntax, you can actually use our search query builder, which is this little gear icon right here. Uh, and if you click on that, um, this kind of guides you, it's kind of a guided search. And, you know, you can, you can as you're typing, so if I type coronavirus, um, COVID-19, you can see up on the top uh, in our securities, we'll just do that search. Um, you can see on the top, it actually starts typing it for you. So as I'm typing, it kind of puts it in there. So we kind of use this both as a, uh, a, a helpful advanced search tool, but as well as, as well a teaching tool to help you find things. Um, but short answer to the question, just click on the search bar on the top and click full search documentation down here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. Our second question, would you mind showing an example of a case or finding a case where the defendants include the People's Republic of China or another government entity? Ah, very good. Yeah, so sure. So we do support um, searching uh, by, so one way we can do it is we can just search for like, you know, China. That obviously is going to get us way too much stuff. Um, so I'm not even going to do it. Uh, we have a search filter where you can search for a party. Uh, so if you go to the advanced search options, press that little gear icon up here, you'll notice here party's name, China. And let's get rid of all this other stuff, on the virus, and let's get rid of securities. Um, so we're gonna search for China, um, but you mentioned that you were only looking for them as a defendant. So let's take a look at, and actually, uh, by the way, I, did, I didn't put this in the presentation, but China has been sued over coronavirus. Um, so we can also select the party type here, uh, defendant, um, and we have other, you know, other um, uh, party types that you can select from, or respondent, you know, a poli, a pelant, you name it. Um, and then we can just do a search for that. And uh, the cases will just come right up. There's quite a few of them. Um, so we can add to this if we wanted to, just uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus. And I'm not sure if this is it. So this is, uh, just to, be cl to clarify, this is not finding the government. This, uh, this is finding any company that has the name China in their name. Um, actually, what we might want to do is change this, let's say Republic. Uh, no, is it a Republic? I forget actually what they call themselves. A People's um, Republic of China. A, oh, yeah, it is a Republic. Okay, so let's say, say Republic China. Thank you, Varen. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go, and it pops right up. Um, the complaint against all defendants. This is the case. So, yep, someone has sued uh, China. <laughs> Here's a complaint, um, and this is a class action involving uh, people involving uh, trying to sue China. I've, I've, I haven't read through this document, so I can't I can't really speak to it that much. Um, but yep, there's this is definitely uh, one such case. And again, um, right now we're looking at the complaint. If we wanted to. Uh, view the full docket. You go there on the left-hand side. Actually, I just did that very quickly. So um, let me just just kind of reload that just to show you. So I just clicked on the search results. Once the document pops up, uh, you can see there's three different tabs here in the top right. Um, this tab that we're looking at right now is kind of the search tab. So it allows you to like search for particular terms and phrases. And you can see that there's a nice like kind of preview here. Uh, and you can bounce around the document. Um, there's also uh, another tab. Um, um, this, this tab is actually really helpful for opinion. Uh, so what, what, this is actually a really cool tab. Um, it's not coming up here. It's not going to really come up in complaints. Um, but if there's any case law that's cited within this document, it will. Um, this tab will actually show you uh, all the case law that's cited and will link to it. So you can actually um, pull up uh, case law that's cited in any document. I'll tell you why this was developed. Um, really, if, 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 if you're involved in a litigation, and your opponent files a motion against you, um, the first thing you want to do is 
download all the cases that are inside the, that, are, that are cited inside that motion. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll be automatically extract all the cited cases for you and um, you know you can export them. Uh, unfortunately, I can probably try to find another document uh, if there's anyone interested in seeing that. Um, but then the first one, the first tab up here is uh, informational and we kind of have the case title and some other information. You can see there's actually related exhibits um, to exhibits that you can bounce to or you can uh, go and view the full docket sheet and that comes up right now, right here. Um, and then if you want to track to see what's going on with this case, uh, class action against China, uh, you know, uh, they already have a scheduling conference set up. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, you can see here, oh, this is actually another um, really great feature of DocuLarm that's actually very helpful. Um, so you can see what we DocuLarm does is we actually go through the docket sheets and the documents and automatically extract deadlines. Um, so in addition to the docket report that you see below, on the top, you also have another report um, for upcoming events. Uh, so these are automatically extracted. You can add them to your calendar uh, with the click of a button. And if you're wondering, like, how, how on earth did Dr. Arm know that there was a joint scheduling report due, uh, you click the source button, and we'll show you exactly where it came from. Um, so here is, uh, we pulled this from the docket sheet. Um, in many cases, these deadlines are actually inside the documents, and we, we actually pulled the deadlines from the underlying documents as well. Sorry, I'm giving long answers to these questions. Apologies. I'm probably raising more questions than I'm answering. Um, but, That's perfectly but fine. Again, uh, yep, sounds good. <laughs> All right, just one more question. Um, this is a little bit more substantive but than technical, but um, uh, the question was, are you seeing more standing orders that are um, being applied in a blanket manner to motions, or are each, each of these standing or each of these cases proceeding by individual case order? So that, that's a great substantive question. And I can tell you um, from what I've seen, it is very, very, very much jurisdiction dependent. Um, just going back to that slide, I, I started pulling this together, right? In that slide, uh, let's just go back to it. Um, so these are the different, these are, uh, this is a sampling of some, um, of some states that are, uh, that have standing orders. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other ones that don't have these standing orders, um, and there's, there's many, many jurisdictions that are definitely going case by case, many of them. Um, you know, as a rough rule of thumb, uh, the more affected an area a region is, the, the more likely there's going to be a standing order. Uh, for the regions that are less affected, uh, less affected, there's probably, they're probably dealing it on case by case. That's a very, very rough uh, uh, overview. I, I think, um, you know, you really do have to look and see what's going on in your particular jurisdictions that you're interested in. Uh, to know for certain. Absolutely, and that would apply to all different types of orders, discovery orders, as well as scheduling orders and things of that nature, correct? Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and also, I'll, I'll note, um, we were talking about standing orders. Some, some jurisdictions, you know, a lot of these courts, they issue these standing orders as a docket sheet, um, which is a little bit strange, but that's what they do. Some states do not issue uh, standing orders at the docket sheet. They just post it to their website or they sometimes send out an email to all the registered attorneys. Um, so docket alarm, if, if you really want to stay on top of standing orders, I, I think docket alarm is, a, is a, or a tool, a docket research tool is, is a necessary component of it, but it's probably not a sufficient component. Uh, you also have to be checking the court's website and, you know, reading your email. Um, I, I would advise that as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, and also, thank you so much for showing that uh, glimpse of the fast case integration tool in Docket Alarm. Um, just answering another question that came up in the chat: um, fast case and Docket Alarm are currently separate tools, but there are integrations from our each of our partners in the tools. So, as you're looking through Docket Alarm, you saw that fast case integration that allowed you to see uh, cases that had been cited in that particular document. And similarly, from the fast case side, you'll see suggestions for Docket that match your current searches. So there will be, as we progress in the future, further integrations between the, to the two tools. And we do welcome you to follow along and see our updates as they happen. Um, I think yeah. that's all the questions that we have. Michael, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, just uh, just wanted to hear, I just pulled up an example of a case. Uh, so this is, a, I just, it's, for those who just saw what I did, I just looked for all motions have the word f.3d in them um, and the purpose of that was just to find cases that have citations um, so uh, I just I just pulled up the first document I found 
Um, and then I clicked on this tab, and you can see here are all the cases that are cited in this tab, uh, in, this, in this motion. Um, this is Supreme Court motion, but this, this applies to, you know, federal cases, district court cases, as well as state court cases. Um, and, you know, all the underlying cases are linked. And when you click on them, it goes to fast case, and you have the full motion there uh, right available for you. Uh, and the big time-saving tool is you can actually export this. Um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than having a paralegal, or sometimes an associate do this, pulling all the cited cases. Uh, so you can just do that with one click um, within Dr. Alarm. Um, so as, as far as closing thoughts, though, uh, go, um, you know, things are changing very, very rapidly. I know this was uh, a very, it's very hard to give a presentation on U.S. litigation at large, uh, right? But so um, I, I know we did bounce around to a bunch of different practice areas uh, and, and jurisdictions, but I hope it gave um, folks on the phone at least some of the tools start to start finding this information on their own um, so that they can actually, you know, help their clients ultimately and uh, navigate what is, what is uh, a very, um, you know, volatile and changing uh, litigation um, uh, situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so definitely everybody stay safe uh, with your family and your loved ones. Um, we're doing the same as here at Fast Kids, but uh, we're, uh, we're all 100% up and running. So um, feel free to reach out and uh, ask us any questions you have. Excellent. I'll reiterate that. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. If you have questions, please feel free to call us at 866-773-2782. And we hope that you'll join us for one of our webinars in the future. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.